All right. I'm really excited today because I have a guest. I've been waiting and waiting and waiting to get a dentist on here. It's like pulling teeth. I can't tell you. <laughs> Scott, it is like pulling teeth to get dentists to come on camera. Uh, Why? I don't that? know. Yeah, because you know what? You, you're speaking truth to power and a lot of them can't handle it. That's why. I love it, but not Dr. Scott Solomon. He is a dentist like no other. And that's why we found each other at Paleo FX yeah. back in May. And um, we've been great friends and, and we believe the same thing. And it's like perfect harmony when it comes to dental health. So let me do a quick intro. And if anybody's watching, please, if you have questions, now's your chance to ask the dentist. And yes, um, ask away, please. Don't be shy out there in Facebook land. Yeah, that's right. And and we're gonna, I've got a bunch of questions I'm gonna go through here. And I already know we're gonna bring them back because there's tons of other questions that I have as well. But let me give you guys a quick little lowdown on Dr. Scott Solomon. Dr. Scott Solomon has practiced general dentistry at Dental Associates of Connecticut since 1989. He focuses on creating healthier patients through a comprehensive approach that combines modern dentistry practices, nutrition, and general health concepts. He graduated from the first ever paleo-based functional medicine in the world, the ADAPT program of the, Chris, or the Cresser Institute. He is also on the Cresser Institute Review Board. He received his DDS at Columbia University School of Dental and Oral Surgery in New York City with a concentration in TMJ disorders. He interned with the USCG in Alameda, California, and went on to receive a fellowship in advanced general dentistry at Fair, Fairleigh Dixon University. He belongs to a ton of dental and medical. Yeah, you can skip all those. Too much. Wait, to I do want to mention a couple things in here. I'll skip over some of them. <clears throat> There's a ton of them. But I want to talk. Uh, so cosmetic dentistry, the Association of Oral Medicine and Toxicology. It's a big um, one. Certified in the safe removal of silver or mercury filling. So if anybody has questions on that. Also, um, let's see the other one that I want. Bi biological dentistry and belongs to the Paleo Physicians Network, Primal Docs, and the Ancestral Health Society. Welcome, Dr. Scott. Well, thanks for that great introduction. I can't wait to hear what I have to say with that introduction. <laughs> you have a lot to say. I know you have a lot to say. First of all, so... What's your overview as a dentist on dental health and how it relates to internal health? Oh, gosh. Um, so it seems to be getting worse, actually. There was a time where, so I've been doing this for over 30 years, and there was hope that we were really gaining traction. But with the, you know, my plate and all that stuff, uh, that's not really sending us in the right direction. I'm sure all of your savvy listeners know this, but you know, a lot of my rank and file patients come in and it's news to them that they shouldn't be eating six to 11 servings of heart healthy whole grains, right? It's, it's amazing. So we've seen an uptick in decay and especially it's really alarming. Kids will be pretty good until their mid to late teens. So all of you who have children of that age, beware. And then, you know, they start to spend time on their own amongst their friends. They got a couple of coins in their pocket. They start drinking whatever that's, the energy drinks and the, all that stuff. And then when they go to college, it's unbelievable. I think they, they have long study sessions and they're sipping a soda for six hours during marathon sessions. And that frequency, of what I like to call dense acellular carbohydrates. Folks, if you take nothing else away from this, we'll talk a little more about that, but any kind of processed carbs, whether it's sugar or not, is just no good for the germs in our body. So we have germs in our mouth, the plaque, and plaque is not bad. Plaque just has a tendency to misbehave when it comes in contact with these highly processed carbs and sugars. And then, of course, we swallow the stuff. And of course, our small intestines have some germs in them, but because of the stomach acid and other things, it's semi-sterile, shall we say. And most of the germs in our digestive systems are in our colon. But when they get this dense acellular carbohydrate, 
they do the same kind of misbehaving and you get inflammation of the gut, you get a, a, a leaky gut, you get toxins creeping into the system, you get a reaction by the immune system and there are low levels of chronic inflammation coming from the entire digestive system. And remember folks that the mouth is the first part of the digestive system. Uh, we're pulverizing the food with our teeth so we're starting to break down the food and we have amylase in our saliva. No other animal really has copious amounts like we have. So we're actually chemically breaking down complex carbs into simple sugars in the mouth. That's my short answer. And you're saying that like the dental health has declined, right? Like it, it's yeah. still declining, which also correlates to internal health is also declining. They go hand in hand. And so you said that plaque isn't all bad. So explain that. Because I know in my mind, plaque is not a good thing. So explain yeah. what you mean by that. Yeah. So um, uh, two years ago, I was on a dental panel. You can pull that up, uh, the Ancestral Health Symposium. Two years ago, I was on a dental panel. Al Dannenberg was on that panel, and he's a gum specialist. They call those folks periodontists. And he spoke about two studies, and it's really cool. Um, so I think, again, most of you guys out there know that tooth decay and gum disease and really a lot of our modern ailments are new. So, um, you know, going back to when we started farming is when we started getting tooth decay. But there's a branch of microbiology called paleomicrobiology, and they can actually uh, reconstitute the DNA of plaque in ancient skulls. And we've always had the germs that cause gum disease in the same proportions, okay? But we've only just gotten gum disease since the Neolithic farming revolution. So uh, Al Dannenberg spoke about uh, you know, that plaque was there and it wasn't causing problems. And there, there have been a couple of studies that show that plaque, given sort of a primal, paleo, whatever you want to call it, you know, whole foods kind of a diet, devoid of processed foods, the plaque does not cause inflammation. But they, especially the one study, they took a group of folks, half of them ate sort of a paleo type diet, the other half ate normally, and they checked their gums before and after. And the markers for inflammation, there's certain things that we can see in the gums, pocketing, that sort of thing, redness, um, went down in the people that were eating, you know, a real good diet, even though the plaque, there was more plaque. But the people that were eating, you know, normal American, standard American diet, the markers went up along with the plaque. So it's the plaque that's misbehaving, really, from from its contact with dense acellular carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, what, a, what about the role of the, the modern, um, probably what the average consumer is using to clean their mouth with, which would be like the all the antiseptic products. Yeah, right, so my- I'm sure that my, has to play some sort of role. Right, my philosophy is that um, the biofilm on the teeth is necessary it really wouldn't be there if it wasn't, okay? So we're meant to have it. So if you, know, if you destroy that with all these rinses and alcohols, um, it, it's, it's really not good for you. Um, you know, in general, um, my philosophy is try to stay as natural as possible. But I also don't want to be dogmatic about things and not everybody has the same concerns. So some people are okay with the pill. Just give me the pill, doc. So you, you have to realize that I'm kind of stuck in a profession that has standards of care. And if I don't adhere to them, I could actually lose my license. So I have to at least tell people that this stuff is out there and this is kind of what's normally done. But, you know, I'm a little abnormal. <laughs> That's why we love each other. That's why we love <laughs> each other. Abnormal. You're not a little yeah. abnormal. <laughs> We're just a little bit outside. So, you know, for one thing, the germs in the mouth actually help. We have a nitrogen cycle, and contrary to what everybody thinks, you know, um, nitrates, nitrites. You know, they they there was this whole thing that they're terrible for you, but I mean, a stalk of celery has way more nitrites in it than a hot dog. Nitrates, whatever, and our saliva has a lot more because where uh, the the germs in the mouth take part of the nitrogen cycle, and. Um, it helps us form nitric oxide. Again, many of your savvy people out 
there probably know that that lowers blood pressure. And Love and nitric things. oxide. Nice things. So that's con nitric oxide, not nitrous oxide, which dentists use as laughing gas, but right. nitric oxide, and it concentrates in the sal you know in the salivary glands. So that's, that's awesome. important that you actually have. A Speaking of saliva, since you brought it up, <clears throat> um, am I breaking up? No, 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 you, well, a little bit, but no, you're back. You're good. No, but okay, it says of, I'm unstable on my end. So oh, you're, just, well, <laughs> you're wooly and unstable. You're a free radical right now. Um, so, speaking of saliva, as long as we don't break up too much, um, yeah, there you go. How much, how important is, because I say saliva is the secretion no one's talking about, but saliva right. is really your 24 hour protection inside your mouth. And when you're using things that, like destroy what your saliva can do, you leave your mouth in too acidic of a condition for your saliva to neutralize and actually function to protect you for 24 hours. What are your thoughts on that and saliva? Right. <clears throat> right, so a um, few things. So um, <clears throat> when we look at the, the formula for tooth decay, it's, um, it's, it's different than probably what, if you pull up on the internet, they make it very simple. And what they'll say is you just need uh, fermentable carbohydrates, susceptible teeth, and cariogenic bacteria. Cariogenic means cavity causing, okay? <clears throat> but all, all carbohydrates are fermentable and we've been eating carbohydrates for a long time. So that's not true. It's again, it's the dense acellular carbohydrates. So the bacteria in the mouth have never seen this in their environment before. And they can actually f change this stuff. Two things happen. The bacteria uh, ferment the carbohydrates into acids. So the pH of the mouth has to be, you know, close to neutral, but any pH under 5.5, that's acidic, is going to result in the minerals kind of melting out of the teeth. And when you have enough mineral melting out of the tooth, you can end up with a hole and that's what a cavity is. But the saliva, on the other hand, can counteract that. It can put the minerals back in the teeth. It can control the, the, the bacteria. It does all sorts of wonderful things. And of course, you need, you need to not have a dry mouth. There's so many things that can dry our mouths out. So many medications allergy medications, over-the-counter stuff, heart medication, it, it, it goes on and on. <clears throat> and then you have stress. You have people who aren't eating properly and they're not, uh, excuse me, they're not sleeping properly and they're under stress and that's also going to result in a dry mouth, which would increase the decay because it decreases the salivary flow, which helps the plaque grow and keep an acidic environment. What about, um fluoride let's open that can of worms because i guess yeah. <laughs> that's a big can of worms that's a really big can of worms so um the first thing is um fluoride in the water let's talk about that because to yeah. me that's a huge thing because nobody you almost don't have a choice because if it's in the can of peas you know in the city that cans your peas and you have nice organic peas you're getting fluoride and you may not even know it. Okay, so it's everywhere. So based on the principles of pharmacology, okay, yeah. you have a chemotherapeutic agent, a drug of some sort, it has to have a certain dose, right? Maybe a too small of a concentration. If you took, you know, a, a tiny little bit of aspirin, it wouldn't do anything. And again, if you, if you ate the whole bottle, it, it wouldn't be very good for you. So there's a therapeutic dose, and then you have to take the aspirin every four to six hours, right? With fluoride, how is there any control when it's in the water? How much water do you drink, right? Do you, and, and you know, are you in an area that already has fluoride in the natural water? So right. in, in Colorado, many of the wells already have unnatural amounts of fluoride in it. That's actually one of the first places they realized what fluoride was doing. Places like um, Colorado, there was places in Italy, had too much fluoride in their water naturally. And it was looked at as a bad thing because it caused 
brown spots and white blotches in the teeth. So number one, we're violating pharmacology because there's no control of how much you take. Okay, that's number one. Number two is, well, who is the target um, patient? It's children with developing teeth. So not only children drink this water, everybody's drinking the water, right? So you're getting, you're giving a drug to somebody who doesn't need it. I would classify it as a drug, chemotherapeutic right. agent, whatever you want to call it. So that's another violation. And then, you know, where the stuff comes from, it's, um, it's actually scary. It, it's, um, it's, it's gotten. <laughs> that's great. It's, industri you say. it's an industrial <laughs> byproduct. It comes from like the scrubbers of smokestacks and, and things like that. But the first, you know, the first thing they noticed in places um, like in Colorado was, was the bad things that happened and they knew it was a toxin. And this, this it's called mottled enamel, the brown and yeah. white spots. So that was a sign of, of fluoride toxicity. Now they've brushed it off as just something, you know, you see. And I believe it's something like 50% of children can have, have fluorosis in areas that they put fluoride in the water. But I think it's something like maybe 25% in areas that don't have fluoride in the water because they're getting it from everything. Gosh, it's probably in Budweiser for all we know. Probably. So, yeah, that's a problem. So there's that. And then, um, so the supposition based on the initial studies, um, what they finally did was they, they um, took the water uh, that they knew had natural fluoridation in it and they gave it to rats. And then they saw that the rats got the fluorosis. So they kind of said, bingo, it's the fluoride. So at that point it wasn't looked at as anything special. And then, um, they, they, um, they did an experiment. I think the first place was uh, Dr. Dean, artificially fluoridated water in 1945 in Grand Rapids. And then he, eight years later, he wanted to see what the results were because, you know, wanted to let the kids, uh, you know, grow up. And this was repeated right near us in Newburgh. The control town was Kingston, New York. Newburgh, we're, we're on the New York border here in Connecticut. And they compared the two and it, and it looked like, yeah, the kids that were in the areas that had fluoridated water had a 50% lower tooth decay. That sounds amazing, doesn't it? How could you right. argue with that, right? So, you know, that was taken away as gospel, but those um, studies were not really controlled for a lot of variables, were they? So it turns out that, you know, the, the initial results were kind of, you know, misinterpreted and, um, you know, it's like that correlation, you know, when, when more ice cream is eaten, there's more shark attacks. You guys probably have heard that out there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the warm weather and everybody's going to the beach. And of course, so then you get, you know, so they, they were connecting dots that weren't kind of really um, uh, connected. So um, later on, it's gotten to the point where in July of 2000, uh, the, the American Dental Association said, you know, we, we can't actually claim this mechanism anymore that that systemic fluoride makes teeth stronger. The theory is that these fluoride molecules would incorporate into teeth and bone and make it right. harder. But that actually was um, debunked by the uh, American Dental Association <clears throat> almost 20 years ago. And uh, the FDA actually- um, I was gonna say, I don't think anybody knows that. No, of that's course. buried. No, that is buried, my friend. That is buried. So the FDA um, it also said you, you have to delete any um, government references previously classifying fluoride as essential or probably essential. Because I can tell you folks out there, there's not one chemical reaction, enzymatic reaction uh, that goes on in the body that requires fluoride. There's nothing in the body that we fabricate as skin, nails, teeth, bone, whatever, that needs fluoride, okay? So it turns out the mechanism, are you ready for this? Yes. It delayed 
the eruption of these children's teeth. Eruption, for those of you out there that aren't familiar, it means when the teeth come in. I don't know why we use such a violent word. It's not that violent, but when these teeth come in, because in the middle way, of the night, when you're a mom and they're yeah, erupting, <laughs> yeah, that's are, why. Exactly, exactly. So what they found was um, that it was a it was a delay in 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 eruption. So the less time a tooth is in the mouth, being exposed to dense acellular carbohydrates, the less decay you get. Um, so that's the mechanism right there. That's interesting. Yeah, I I mean, I knew fluoride didn't save your teeth from cavities. I didn't know about the buried research. Yeah, know. yeah. So I, I, I have an article on my website, drscottsolomons.com on that. Yeah, so, you know, we'll post those when we get done yeah. here. We'll, we'll get the articles and post them um, yeah. so people can find them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's my take on systemic fluoride. I would stay away from it. So that's why, I mean, I don't really like to drink things that come in cans and, you know, you got to be really careful because I, I, I don't, I don't think fluoride's good for you. Minerals. I mean, right. You, you would want to put the minerals back in your teeth because that's what is making your mouth, your teeth strong. Right. Right. You don't need fluoride. You don't need and, fluoride. And calcium supplements, um, you know, when they go back and they look at all the studies, people who supplement with calcium pills live shorter lives. So you need real food. You need to be getting your calcium from real food. Real sources, yeah. Absolutely. I know, I don't wanna, I wanna be respectful because you're on your lunch hour. So about five to 10 more minutes only, but I did wanna touch on the amalgam fillings as well. Yes. Cause that right. is a, like a pain point for a lot of people. And um, are they, are they bad? Should they be removed? You know, go, go into what your common questions that you get about the amalgam fillings. Right. Okay. So when, when we were in dental school, um, it was very common um, for the instructors, professors to um, laugh at the idea that there could be any possible problem with mercury fillings. So just to, you know, give a little background, they call them silver fillings, but they're actually slightly less than 50% silver and they're slightly more than 50% mercury. They're also called amalgams because they're not actually alloys. And I didn't know this actually, okay? They didn't really teach us metallurgy too much in dental school. But when you make an alloy like pewter, and let's say you take your drill, you drill your hole into pewter and those little shavings come out, it's still pewter. But when we drill, an amalgam filling out, it's a crystallized version of silver and mercury crystallized together and those bonds break and you get raw mercury and it's a liquid to begin with and it actually vaporizes very easily. So it gets into the air. So when we were in dental school, you mix the stuff together you put it in somebody's mouth an inch from their brain. And if there was a little scrap left over, you, you weren't allowed to throw it in the garbage. Okay, what's wrong with this picture? I can put it near your brain, in your body, your mouth, but it's dangerous to put it. Why would it be? Why couldn't we just throw it out? I don't, I don't understand it. So nobody gave me a proper explanation of it, but of course we now are the wiser. It, it vaporizes and it's highly toxic. Is there any scientist who would tell you that mercury is good for you? I don't think so. So it's vaporizing. And yes, you know what? Sad to say, people that grind their teeth together, if you have hot coffee, mercury is leaching off of your fillings. There's a video, and I say look at it with caution on YouTube because you can't unsee things. It's called the smoking tooth. Oh, I and haven't seen that. A tooth that's been pulled, and they rub a cloth on it in front of a fluoresc you know, a fluorescent light of yeah. a certain frequency, and it looks like it's smoking. That's mercury vapor. So yes, there is that concern. So. Um, you know, since I do the functional medicine, I also have a, like a study meetup group with all of the forward thinking healthcare practitioners in the area. 
because uh, heavy metal toxicity is is huge, okay? And um, when it's identified, especially mercury, there aren't any dentists out there that won't know how to remove it safely or even think that's anything that should be done. So I see patients from that come hours to see me with real problems. So if there's any you know suspicion of a of a problem, uh, you know coming from your primary doctor and mercury is is, is uh, one of the heavy metals, the primary um, exposure is through uh, mercury fillings in your mouth. So at that point. Um, considering removing them is a good thing, but they, it has to be done very, very safely. So if I walked up to you on the street and put two drops of mercury in your mouth, you'd have me arrested and I'd go to jail. But as a dentist, if I drill a small filling out that's 50% mercury, and let's say two drops of mercury end up in your mouth, you can't go after, I'm legally untouchable. I think that is a core standard of care. Unfortunately, uh, dentists like me are few and far between. Uh, so I'm involved with the IAOMT. It's, a, it's too long to say, but that's an organization.org that you're, you guys can, can look at. And um, their mission is to you know, try to keep uh, dubious chemicals out of your mouth. Um, so they, they um, have this SMART program, it's called. And basically, it's not rocket science. It's really not. Um, we have to isolate the tooth with a dental dam. We use nitrile now, not rubber, because most offices would be latex-free. So it's a little sheet of rubber, kind of the size of a napkin. We poke a hole in it, and the tooth sticks through the hole. And so it's, it's isolated from your mouth. That one tooth, when we drill the filling out, nothing goes in your mouth. But it's vaporizing, so we take precautions. We have you know masks and things. We open the windows, even in the winter, we get the, you know, circuit, we get the air out of there. We have air purifiers. There's um, a rinse that we do before and after. We put a cap on the patient. We drape the whole entire body. Again, that's not rocket science, but most dentists are like, what for? What, for? you know, so these poor patients, uh, you know, they have nowhere to go. So, you know, I see them. So you want to make sure if you're not near Connecticut, I know you see patients from all over probably, but you want to make sure that your dentist is certified, right? right. In taking well, out. I don't know how many, you know, you can go on IAOMT.org and okay. we'll be listed there. And I don't know how many there might be in Montana or Wyoming. Right. I don't know. So again, I would say the lion's share of um, the protection you get is from the dam and the nose piece of oxygen. So most dentists use nitric oxide for their patients sometimes. So that's a combination of nitrous oxide and oxygen. Mm -hmm. So leave the nitrous off, get put on 100% oxygen, breathe through the nose so you don't get the, you know, the, the vapor. And that's really the lion's share of it. Um, the rest of it, I think, is, is a small portion of it. But for patients who have real problems, we'd want to do all that. And so, you know, that's what people expect me to do. I'll absolutely do that for everybody. But um, for people who maybe don't have real issues and are not, you know, 100% concerned and they don't want to drive, you know, two days to see somebody, <laughs> Um, you know, just the dental dam and I think, you know, the nose piece and high speed, you know, that suction that they use to yeah. suck all the water and debris, that's all important. So I saw a study um, that said peroxide can break down um, amalgam fillings and leach the mercury into your, into your body, which is really concerning because a lot of dental products contain peroxide. So... I mean, what are your thoughts on, on that? I mean, yeah. it's a simple, people don't know this stuff. That's what drives me nuts is why is it, yeah. you know, people don't understand and don't know this. It's not on the label that says, do not use if you have mercury fillings. So it's just. Right. Cause it's just not, it's not, um, it's not looked at as, as a concern. So there's no reason to address it. Um, you know, people get the wrong idea. They think, because I actually, uh, you know, I still have a lot of sort of just patients that are normal that aren't here because of any holistic stuff. 
um, and I'm always going to run it by them if they need a filling removed. Um, I still actually have some people that say, eh, I don't care. Don't do it. And they don't understand that the stuff is cumulative. Yeah. The mercury yeah. has a tendency to, to settle into your fat tissue, fatty tissues. So maybe not today. You do your whitening with your peroxide in it. But, you know, for, you know, those people that bleach all the time, there might be a, a point where they hit their toxic burden and then it's trouble because that stuff is in there in your, in your tissues. And it's, it's once we try to get it out, uh, chelation, take these chemicals that basically flood your, it's now just flooding your bloodstream and your body is in panic mode and yeah. you're trying to pee it out and it's getting displaced and it's moving around and it's pretty brutal. It's actually very brutal. So um, my preference for, um, you know, getting rid of heavy metals and mercury is actually far infrared sauna. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, home ones are relatively affordable. And, um, you know, if you're having problems, you can sweat it out. Interestingly enough, oh, wow. uh, mercury is mined, but it, it, the ore is called cinnabar. And a lot of the local cultures have these sweat lodge um, traditions. To get rid of it. They, they just knew. Um, it's much gentler. It'll take, it could take a long time, but, you know, have patience because again, chelation can be pretty rough on a lot of people. I went through it. I was toxic with mercury because I didn't know that I was breathing the stuff in and I couldn't take the chelation after a while. And um, there are some scientific studies that show that the, the, the uh, sauna, the far infrared sauna, or just really just sweating, sweating is, yeah. a, is a good way to do it. And, you know, not to be confused with near infrared and also red light therapy, which I think for skin, which yeah. I know that's your thing. I love it. That's yeah. another thing I couldn't um, uh, say, you know, too many good things about. So really quick, because I, I, we're getting late on time and I don't want you to miss your lunch. Um, how bad is peroxide for the enamel or the dentin? I mean, I, cause you know, um, we talked about teeth whitening. I make a peroxide free version of it that will help rebuild the enamel. So just a little bit about yeah, like, peroxide yeah, in your it, teeth. It mostly, it's, it's like a desiccant. And I mean, and it's, you know, it's, it's a free radical, right? So there's that. Um, it can desiccate the teeth. Um, we, we have plenty of pain. I'm in a group practice. So we have people in and out of here all the time that are doing it. Yeah. And um, yeah, people get sensitive teeth for sure when they do it sometimes. Um, but I've been, uh, it's been around for a long time. I've never seen any real long-term damage. It's very, very rare that there would be any long-term problems with it. Um, and usually if somebody wants to whiten their teeth one way or the other, you know, it's, it's usually a short course. So I'm not too, I mean, I like Western medicine and yeah. feeling good and looking good about yourself. I mean, look at you. I'm right. just looking at you with this thing. Um, it's nice to look good and feel good. So sometimes, uh, you know, we might go out in the sun because we want to tan and oops, we get a little burn. But, you know, that's that's sometimes you got to take the, the good with the bad. So my take is it's not a hugely bad thing. Yes, you can you know, uh, look at food and, oh my God, it has oxalates in it and it's got leptins and lectins and, right, you know, right. you will end up not eating anything. So you have to name your poison, I guess. Right, right. So, I mean, for me, uh, as much as I would, you know, I have different labels of biological and holistic and all that stuff, but I do fully embrace most of what, you know, Western medicine can do because I always say when body parts fail, Western medicine is really king. So let's say I broke my front tooth in half and expose the nerve, it's really painful, it's disfiguring, and it potentially it's dangerous because that's gonna get infected and you're gonna have an abscess right under your nose near your brain. Um, so no amount of acupuncture, not to throw an acupuncturist under the bus, but that has to be fixed by sort of man-made ways. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, my, my advice is don't break a tooth, my advice is don't get a cavity because now you're looking at any kind of man-made material. So the 
composites are much better than the amalgams, but you could look at composites and say, oh, BPA, and then there's all this other stuff. BPA just for some reason got the spotlight, but trust me, there's thousands <laughs> of things, even in the, the best ones that are recommended by the IOMT, it's all chemicals. Right. So, right. you know, again, name your poison. So you can have a hole in your tooth or you can get it fixed or you can get it pulled. And, you know, this, that's a rabbit hole. Everybody's entitled to dive down their own rabbit hole, I suppose. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to add uh, before we say thank you and let you enjoy a little bit of lunch before you get back to seeing patients? Um, just that um, when I saw you last spring at Paleo FX, I could just, you like exude health and happiness and that you want to help people. And so uh, like right away, I think we connected. We just knew before we said anything, before we had a chance to exchange too many words. And then for those of you who haven't seen it, I don't know if it's available. You might have to pay for it, but you gave a talk at Paleo FX that I would have given. Remember that talk? Oh yeah. Uh-huh. And it was amazing. So, you know, your company, I really admire your products and what you do. And thank you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Dr. Scott Solomons, guys. I'm going to post your website. And then um, I know somebody had a, cav a question about a gum line cavity. Um, okay. Can you just touch on a gum line cavity? Is that? Yeah. So the technical name is cervical decay. The cervix is the part of the tooth by the gum line. And so when we get the biofilm of plaque, it has a tendency to form mostly along the gum line. All right. So if it's left there for any length of time, the, uh, that colony will lower the pH, okay, mm -hmm. make it acidic, and then the minerals can leach out. Now, uh, there's another thing that goes on by the gum line. Uh, well, two other things, really. People can get recession. Yeah, the receding gums. Okay. Um, but there's a, a, a thing called an abfraction, A-B, as in boy, abfraction. And it's typically from grinding, clenching, and gum chewing. That constant sort of back and forth um, compresses the enamel by the gums, and it flakes off. And so you can get recession and what looks like a notch. And of course, the plaque love that little hole, that little notch, it's even easier. And the enamel is much harder. So if you lose the enamel, you might have a little bit of the underlying tooth structure, which we call dentin, mm -hmm. uh, exposed. And it's, it's more prone to decay. It actually, if you look at it under a microscope, it looks like I'm holding a bunch of straws that you're looking at on end. Just it's very a bunch of holes. So the bacteria can get in there and, it, and just really stay. And, and so gum line cavities are, are typical in smokers and people with dry mouths, I would say. And that makes That's sense. I mean, that, with that too. Um, I made my toothpaste. I have to send you some. I don't think I sent you any. And I, it wasn't- I have powder. it. You your have it? Your tooth powder or your toothpaste? Toothpaste. Oh no, I, don't, I have your toothpaste. I'll powder. send you some toothpaste. My oh, toothpaste you. is made with colloidal silver. So, because colloidal yes. silver can actually kill the bacteria in those pockets. Right. I mean, I'm talking to you, you know this stuff, but. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why I made it with colloidal silver and then the three clays with the baking soda. Right, I love that, yeah. Alkaline. So I'll I send some that. out to you. Thank you, very good. That sounds great. So the way that it's going, you know, because we're talking about if plaque isn't bad, so we're moving towards a biofilm sort of management system. And it's interesting, so there, there um, are these little um, devices that can be introduced under the gums, and um, they're using erythritol. So these, you know, like xylitol, these yeah. sugar alcohols have um, bacteria, static bactericidal, so they kill germs and limit germs. And also, they break up biofilm, you know, they, they don't let them clump together in the colonies so much, so they can't concentrate. So that's kind of maybe in the not too distant future you know, that'll be the norm. That'll be nice instead of all the scraping and the, you know, all that stuff that goes on. It'll be a more gentle process because I mean, listen, you don't really, if you're eating a perfect diet, do you really have to brush and floss? Not really. We know that from our paleo, <laughs> but um, it's just like, I guess I don't have to wash my hair and comb it. It probably wouldn't really lead to a disease, but gross. 
Right. So, right. I mean, I think it's nice to kind of keep your mouth clean and fresh. Yeah. I mean, brushing is good, but it, not brushing to strip away everything and destroy yeah, exactly. everything, right? Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah. So. All right, Dr. Scott, thank you. It was okay, so great. Any more questions? I have a few more minutes. If I know, ready. but I want you to be able to eat. You're on your lunch. No, hour. I ate. Are you kidding me? Oh, you I ate eat. lobster, wild I... caught flounder, I, I, and broccoli, fresh broccoli. I'm, I'm, I eat great. And Talk about a, like the diet that you should, like a dental diet. What would someone yeah, eat if they so, wanted to hurt their mouth? Um, so um, we already spoke about, uh, well, let me mention Weston A. Price, okay? I'm sure most of your listeners out there know about Weston A. Price. So he called this stuff the displacing foods of modern commerce. That was his name for, for processed food. But the, the real problem is that this dense acellular carbohydrate, not only does it help your plaque make acids, the other thing is it helps the plaque make lipopolysaccharides. That's a fancy word for something that's a local toxin. And they wouldn't normally do that. These germs don't normally do that um, with a normal diet. So, so these things cause gingivitis. So it causes swelling. And then eventually your gums can get so swollen that these lipopolysaccharides are able to penetrate into the circulation and so you have like a leaky mouth and then I call, yeah, I, I call it leaky gum serum. Yeah, absolutely. So then it, it, they're called endotoxins once they get in and it causes chronic low levels of inflammation. So number one is limit the processed carbs. Now, unfortunately we're hardwired for carbohydrates. It's in our D DNA. It's really an instinct to want it. Um, it's just that it's been so highly processed. It literally lights up our brain, just like heroin. Um, Stefan Guiennet has a nice book on the neuroregulation of appetite. And he shows functional MRIs. And this stuff lights up our brains, ladies and gentlemen. So it's easy for me to sit here and go, don't eat Doritos. But boy, it's hard to not touch that bowl of Doritos because it's a brain explosion. So if you can, limit that stuff. Um, and then really whole foods, any time you have, uh, even if it's, there's carbs in, in, in the food, um, it's locked inside of a plant cell and, and this plant has a cell wall, that's, it's, it's fiber. We can't digest fiber. So it breaks down so slowly, we're not going to get a sugar bomb and we don't get a spike of sugar and, and, and it's, it's, that's how we evolve. So unprocessed foods if you're going to have carbs that's fine but it should really be unprocessed and then weston a price was very keen on the fat soluble vitamins they help uh with bone and teeth okay so and bone is so important we forget about the the jaw bone as the supportive and i just um talked to friends of mine um the coltons they have a new um, book out about osteoporosis but we were talking about how the dentist can actually, on x-ray and looking at your mouth, be the first to diagnose Absolutely. the issue. So, yeah. 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 So vitamin A, D, and K2 mm -hmm. um, are, are the fat-soluble vitamins that help you make certain proteins that uh, once you get the calcium in your body, what to do with it. So there's a, a protein... MGLA, which calls for the calcium to come here. It's in our hard tissue. And that, if we don't have those fat soluble vitamins, we're not making that to the extent we should. And it's not turned on or activated unless we have vitamin K2. Luckily, vitamin K2 is pretty easy to get. It's in animal fats, butter, dairy. It's pretty easy. Uh, but then there's another um, molecule in our soft tissues. Uh, excuse me, I have it backwards. Osteocalcin is, is, is in our heart tissues. MGLA is in the soft tissue. And that says, get out of here, calcium. I don't want you here. So you can get, um, you know, the, the, the plaque in the arteries is actually 30% calcium. Okay, so I think it's the, the, the Dutch, they're doing, the, in Netherlands, are doing some, some studies on reversing the plaque in um, coronary artery disease by giving vitamin K2. So the fat soluble vitamins to get the calcium where it needs to be. Calcium supplements in general, though, by themselves are considered a little dangerous 
be honest with you, I, I would try to get the calcium you know, from, the, from the diet and real foods. Um, and then a couple of other things that go on. So when I eat a, an artichoke, okay, I don't know how many people like artichokes. I love artichokes. You know, to scrape and discard, right? Oh. Scrape and, no, no, guess what? Eat the whole thing. You'll be chewing and using your jaw like you're supposed to. Well, that's so, the thing. Dr. You're Mike supposed Mew. to. We don't. Yeah. Dr. Mike Mew, another really good person to look up. Dr. Mike Mew, he was actually on uh, the questionnaire, the, the question part of our panel this year at the Ancestral Health Symposium. We did another talk this year. Um, so he's about facial development. And it's critical that we chew hard things. Okay. If we're not, we're not going to develop the robust jaws. Well, that was part of what Dr. Weston A. Price talked about too, is yes. how, you know, when he looked at the third world countries, the first thing you notice is their big teeth and their big jaws and their smile. Beautiful. But yeah. you also have to go beyond that and notice that they're usually not obese. They don't have heart disease. They don't have diabetes, right? right. Exactly. <laughs> so, there's so there's that. And then, um, you know, the tongue, the tongue posture is, is important because now that we're not outside playing in the dirt and all that stuff, um, we get allergies a, a lot more in, in, in the first world. And so if, you, if your child becomes a mouth breather like this, the tongue is not on the roof of the mouth pushing the jaw up and out. And so you get a constricted arch. So the face, if I turn sideways, can you see me? Yes. This part of the face is back and down. And, and so if Wait, we do that look, again. Give this, me a second. Do that again, because I think yeah. I was on the screen. So this part of your face, your maxilla, ends up being farther back and down. And the arch, instead of it being nice and round, can get very constricted. And then there's, real, there's really no room for the tongue. It never went there in the first place, and now it can't. And it could cause speech problems, mouth breathing, facial deformation. But the front, so if this is your nose, this is your maxilla and mandible, the bones that you chew with. Right behind those bones is your airway. Mm -hmm. So as those move down and back, your airway narrows. And we're seeing babies that have sleep apnea. So oh, wow. with sleep apnea, you get secondary problems, ADD, anxiety, depression, all sorts of things, and probably shorter lives. So um, again, going back uh, to the panel this year, Dr. Kevin Boyd, he's a pediatric specialist in Chicago. He's pediatric, but he really does um, airway. He, when, you, when you identify these problems early on, it's exercises and little spacers, little you know, you know, appliances that can put the face back where it belongs and take advantage of growth. We can still do that sort of thing when we're adults, but it requires orthognathic surgery, requires braces and surgery to move the jaws. The results are great. People end up looking beautiful and, and they can breathe and they can function and it's a wonderful thing, but it's all about catching it early. So chewing hard foods is very important and breastfeeding, 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 breastfeeding. Did I say it enough, breastfeeding? Say it again. It's the perfect food. It's got everything a baby needs. And of course, that suckling mechanism causes the face to go up and out. And that's a beautiful face. That's a beautiful child and will grow into a beautiful And it's face. also protective of your sinus cavities as well. Because I know Absolutely. a lot of people, you know, when you don't have good bacteria, it, the same bacteria in your mouth is probably in your nose, and then that goes to your sinuses as well. So frequent sinus infections is also another thing people suffer with when they have issues with their mouth and jaw. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So I think we've taken up almost all of your lunch. Let me see if there's okay. any questions. If there's, yeah, I probably have a few more minutes, so... Okay, so let me see what other questions we had on our list that I can go into. Um, we talked about most of these important, okay. So what, let's talk a little bit about systemic disease. Um, I, I, there's a connection, and I don't know if you've heard this connection or if I mentioned it to you when we met. Um, and I always say it's death by design, you know, big Cosmo, death by design. The more havoc they can wreck inside your body, um, the better. Um, but I read an article recently about 
um, how fluoride can open, you know, your blood brain barrier channel is like your leaky gums. You get leaky gums, you get leaky gut. And the next thing that happens is you get leaky brain syndrome and that fluoride can open the gateway into your brain. And if you're using aluminum deodorants, the deodorant, the aluminum can leak and in, leach into your brain. But they've also found the, the bacteria that causes gum disease in the brains of people with Alzheimer's. Yes, I actually have a blog recently. Let me see if I could, um, I'm looking at it behind you. Let's see. I, do you have a blog about that? I do. Let me see if I can, uh, it's, it's here. Um, uh, I got it here somewhere. But um, yes, yeah, so what they found, this is actually, this was an amazing study. Um, so, what they found um, in the brains of human beings, okay, this obviously post-mortem, they used fancy schmancy equipment and they used a variety of them, so it wasn't just one. Um, that's PCR. What they can do is amplify the DNA of the bacteria that they find. And if they have a little bit, they can amplify and go, oh, we know what germ this is. So P. gingivalis is the germ that causes gum disease. They're finding it in the, the plaques, the neurofibrillary tangles in the brain. And it's more, this is all one study. This is incredible that a study did all this. So what they um, determined was that uh, P. gingivalis makes something called, or a variety of things called ginger pains. What a word, ginger pain, like pain, ginger pain. <laughs> And they cause problems with the neurons and the glial cells and all that, okay? It gets better. Now, they did not do this on humans. They went to rats and, my, rat and or mice. And um, they found, and I don't remember the names, two chemotherapeutic agents that can destroy the ginger pains and actually have a better outcome. Wow. Now, better that you don't get the P. gingivalis and the aluminum and the fluoride opening up the leaky brain, but there's hope for those who are now suffering. It's a terrible, terrible disease. I've seen many people go through a decade of it. It's pretty terrible. So if there's any way to reverse it, there's a little bit of hope. All from this one study, it's somewhere on my blog. Not too, I did I'll it, look for it relatively it. recently. I thought I had it pulled up here. Let's see. I can't find it. What is your website for your blog? So it's just drscottsolomons.com. Oh, here it is. It's September 16th. A new study shows gum disease may cause Alzheimer's disease. Oh, I love it. Okay. I'll post your website too, but yeah. hard mouth. Um, you have so many great articles. Well, thanks. It's really, you know, it's not for my health. It's for everybody else's health. Well, I, I used to have this idea that, you know, I was so, I'm so comfortable one-on-one -on -one in my room. I've been doing it. It's nice. You know, I got such wonderful relationships with my patients, but, you know, I'm not getting any younger and there's a lot of people out there I can help. So I said, well, all right, the, the internet, you know, for a guy who's approaching 60, you know, I'm getting a little more comfortable. I, 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 maintain the website. I do all the research on my own. It takes a while, but I feel like I can hopefully, you know, reach other people and, and help people help themselves really, because, you know, if you're the best dental patient in the world, you're only in the dental office two times a year for cleaning. Now we use, we spend an hour. Okay. So that leaves 8,758 hours of a given year that you're not in my office. You think I'm causing you not to have a cavity or gum disease and all the other things that go along with it? No. So unfortunately, it's really up to the individuals to educate themselves and find the motivation. And I know you do a great job. You know, you walk the walk, you look fantastic. So you're going to motivate people to hopefully want to take care of themselves. And I'm, I'm trying to be a little bit like you. Oh, no, I was going to say what's funny. I, and I think that's why we were, we connected so well is because you walk the walk and talk the talk too. Um, you're very healthy and health minded, but more importantly, you want to share the message that you can be healthy and, and it's not really that hard, right? Uh, it's on paper, it's not hard. I will tell you that I have a lot of patients that 
and friends and family that cannot stay away from those troublesome foods. And it's not that they're weak people. It's that those foods are drugs. They're drugs. Their brain right. lights up. And so I do, we have some people that need the, the gastric bypass. And I'm not saying don't have one because they were probably going to die of the, all the morbidities. Um, so it gets that drastic that on paper, just stop eating Doritos and sugar pops. But it's very, very difficult for some people. It really is. And my heart goes out to those people. Right. So if you have to get the gastric, if that's the last resort, that should be the last resort, but you got to do it because you'll be dead. However, bypassing the mechanism of absorbing nutrients, the mouth suffers greatly from that. Oh, yes. I have yeah. patients with so, most obese people are already have numerous uh, nutrient deficiencies. This again, I, this is on my website. It only actually gets worse when you have the bypass because it's specifically making you not absorb nutrients. That's why you lose weight. Right. So it's got another edge to that sword. It's a lot of good. You lose the weight and you're going to live, but it becomes much more difficult to maintain the teeth. So the message is simple, but for, for a lot of people to actually execute it, it can be hard. Can be hard. And I agree with, I totally agree with you. Um, the, the, it seems really simple. I think one of the best things people can do is change what they're using. Don't you think like what you're cleaning your mouth with, it, it doesn't need to be to another toxic chemical and at least get that environment healthy while you're brushing your teeth. So hopefully you can create saliva. Yes. Yes. That, um, Cause that's my whole point is I want to provide the products that create that oral wellness so that your saliva can actually protect you for 24 hours. And when you eat the bad stuff, cause I'm not an angel, I'll eat some of the bad stuff too. Me at too. least I know that my saliva is healthy and is going to wash that right. away, neutralize the acids, remineralize if it needs to and help reestablish my microbiome. Did I say I, it well? I totally agree with that approach. If you had to take the, um, the one thing, what's the one thing? So I look up to Dr. Perlmutter with his grain brain. One thing. He has yeah. a whole book. There's a lot more than one thing in the book, but one <laughs> thing. And that's a smart guy, okay? You probably that's saw Very him. smart, yep. And then you have Dr. Davis, wheat belly. One thing, give up wheat. So if, if there's one big thing that I would say. Dr. Solomon. Carb one mouth. Thing. What is carb it? Carb mouth. Carb mouth. Get rid of those dense acellular processed carbohydrates. Okay. Because Weston A. Price, not only were they the foods of modern commerce, they, they were the displacing foods of modern commerce because the processed stuff displaces the nutrient dense stuff. That's a problem because the nutrients are the building blocks that you need, okay? The raw calories, the, you know, the, the, the carbs and the sugars are just sort of the electricity or the gasoline to run the engine. But you're, if you're building a building, yeah, you have to put gasoline in the, in the machinery, but you need a steady supply of really good quality building materials, and that's the, the, the nutrients. So if they delivered nothing but gasoline to a building site, you wouldn't end up with a building, right? right. Right. So that's You're absolutely problem. right. Those carbs, those carbs, just too much. Too much. I know. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll talk again because I want to talk about pregnancy and baby. So we'll talk again. All right. That sounds great. Thanks everybody for listening. I hope you got something out of it. And Trina, you're the best. Uh, Love thanks, you. Dr. Solomon. Back at you. <laughs> Bye. Talk to you later.